So chemical properties of urinalysis use a urine dipstick and uh, a couple of things. So there's a whole lot of tests and we're just going to focus on some of these tests. We've already talked um, a lot about some of them, but one thing to realize is that some of these tests are actually invalid in animals and that includes um, leukocyte esterase. So we can't use that um, and we can't use nitrate and actually in some dipsticks, you're also provided specific gravity, and that is not valid on the dipstick either. Urobilinogen is not really something we're going to talk about. We'll talk about it later when we talk about liver. Um, so these are the main tests that we're going to focus on, at least briefly, um, and we'll kind of go through them in some detail, and that's glucose, ketones, protein, blood, bilirubin, and pH. So urine pH really can't be looked at in a vacuum because it's dependent on what's going on in the, in the animal. Uh, and in general, we see acid urea or acidic urine. Um, we see acidic urine in um, carnivores, and this is any carnivore. And we see alkaline urine more often in herbivores, just in general. We would expect in an animal with an acidosis, um, they would have acidic urine. And we would expect in an animal with an alkalosis, they would have um, alkaline urine. So that's kind of what's normal, and there's some caveats to that, which I'm gonna tell you about. A couple of things to realize is that since the sediment, excuse me, since the, um, the dipstick is actually based on chemical reactions, the pH of urine can actually impact some of those reactions. And one of them is related to alkaline urine, which I'll tell you about in a second. So one other thing that I actually want to mention just briefly is the fact that um, in some animals, they, um, because of abnormalities with their acid base and their electrolytes, they can actually have acidic urine when they should have alkaline urine. And we're going to kind of go through that in class and I will tell you a little bit more about that later. So since glucose is a relatively small molecule, it passes through the glomerulus and then it has to be reabsorbed in the proximal renal tubule. So you can actually see glucose in the urine in two, in two instances. One is where you have a high plasma glucose, and we'll talk about this when we talk about uh, diabetes. And this means that it's actually exceeding the renal threshold ability for it to be um, taken up. And so those numbers, which I'll always provide to you, would be something like greater than 180 to 220 milligrams per deciliter in the dog. That means the plasma glucose. And in the cat, it's about 100 more than that, so 280 to 290 milligrams per deciliter uh, in the cat. And that means that the plasma value is higher than that, and so it spills over. Um, and so the other is where you actually have renal tubular injury, especially to your, mostly to your proximal convoluted tubule. And so you can't actually reuptake the normal amount of glucose that's in the blood. Uh, and so that's again, that proximal convoluted tubular injury. And that's where we usually also see the secretional metabolic acidosis. So we see ketonuria in animals in a negative energy balance. And so this could be um, cattle, cows that have recently calved, potentially. Um, it could be any animal that is in a state of negative energy where they're producing ketones. And since ketones are seen in the urine before they're actually seen in circulation, you tend to see them first. We'll talk more about this when we actually talk about diabetes and diabetic ketoacidosis. So again, it's secondary to ketosis. So it could be complicated diabetes mellitus, and again, that negative energy balance. Uh, and so we'll talk more about that later on. So when the dipstick's positive for blood, it's actually identifying hemoglobin because it lyses the red blood cells or lyses whatever's there and it then causes um, a reaction so that it's detecting hemoglobin. So that means, or it's detecting actually myoglobin, so it detects both. So that means that your differentials, of course, are going to be intact red blood cells and that would be hematuria. And then the other one that we've talked about, of course, many times, especially in the first section, was um, hemoglobinuria. And so you're going to look for other evidence of intravascular hemolysis. And then lastly, there would be myoglobinuria, which we haven't done muscle yet, but when we do, we'll talk more about that.
And of course, it's important to remember that free hemoglobin and free myoglobin can actually damage the renal tubules themselves. Um, and so that could cause a secondary uh, renal disease that's unrelated. So this is one of those examples that can also cause a positive protein result because these are all proteins. So that's when we, um, that could be red cells, which would be a postrenal proteinuria where hemoglobin and myoglobin spill over from the, um, from the circulation into the urine and that's that postrenal proteinuria. So since those are proteins. So the dipstick protein is not specific for albumin, but it detects albumin more so. So um, there's numerous kind of considerations for why we have protein in the urine. One is in highly concentrated urine, so that adequate concentration, we see concentration of our normal distal tubular proteins, called those, ham, those TAM horse fall proteins. And so we can see a mild to maybe more moderate proteinuria. So it's usually one plus, two plus, or potentially trace protein. And so that's, again, in more concentrated urine samples. So that's a non-pathologic proteinuria. We can also see pre-renal proteinuria, and this is that overflow proteinuria. And this is, again, due to hemoglobin um, or myoglobin spilling over from our glomerulus. We can have renal proteinuria, and our renal proteins can be due to tubular disease, so acute tubular injury or other um, types of renal disease, and we can have glomerular proteinuria. And so we worry the most about this when we have a lower urine-specific gravity um, we have a concurrent positive SSA that's also um, increased. Remember, that's that precipitation test. Um, and to confirm, we're going to look for a UPC that's increased because, of course, that measures albumin. And it's albumin that spills through our glomerulus, um, through our damaged glomerulus, and actually gets into our urine. Uh, lastly, we have our uh, postrenal proteins, and this is usually inflammation or hemorrhage. Um, so postrenal protein is, let's see, proteinuria. That's going to be hemorrhage or inflammation within our um, kind of after our kidneys so our bladder urethra. Um, the last one to consider is, I'm going to put it in a different color, is false positive reactions. And this is when we have alkaline urine. Remember, it's a color, it's a color um, chemistry change. So um, we have an alkaline pH. So this is usually uh, a pH that is greater or equal to eight. So eight or nine, essentially. And so we get a false positive reaction. And so then we can confirm with an SSA. So we'll confirm with our SSA. And it's usually that's less affected by pH. So we would expect then the SSA to be negative. It was not. Um, a false positive due to the pH, or if it, if it was a false positive due to the pH. So bilirubin, of course, we've talked about if you have increase in bilirubin in the blood, and that's specifically something called conjugated bilirubin, um, so which is water-soluble and not bound to albumin, so there's no albumin-related. Um, you can see that. And of course, we look for, so far we've talked about hemolysis, but when we talk about cholestasis and liver disease. And then the other time that we actually see it is in really concentrated, so we look for a concentrated urine-specific gravity. So concentrated urine in dogs because they have a low renal threshold for, for bilirubin. So we would expect it to be one plus or maybe two plus or less than those. Um, and that's concentrated urine specific gravity. It concentrates that normal amount of bilirubin that gets through, um, that gets kind of not reabsorbed by the tubules.